Substances, stuff, are made of atoms. The different types or elements of atoms are represented in the periodic table by symbols. A compound is a substance that contains two or more different types of atoms chemically bonded together. For example, the chemical formula for water is H2O. Every molecule of water is made of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. These atoms change what they're bonded to and how they're bonded through chemical reactions. We can represent a reaction with a word equation or a chemical equation using symbols. As atoms are not created or destroyed in a chemical reaction, there must be the same number of each type of atom on both sides. So sometimes we have to balance equations. Pro tip, start balancing atoms that are only in compounds. So with this one, let's go with the carbons first. There's one on the left, one on the right, so that's all good. Hydrogens, however, there are four on the left, only two on the right. Now, we can't change the small numbers because that would change what the compound is. So all we can do is put numbers in front of elements or compounds to multiply them up. Stick a two in front of the H2O. We now have two times two hydrogens, so that's four on the right as well. That's also double the oxygen in it, however, so we now have four oxygens altogether on the right, still only two on the left, so doubling the O2 on the left takes care of that. If there's an element in a reaction, like the oxygen here, we always balance that last, as there's no knock-on effect then. A mixture is any combination of different types of elements and compounds that aren't chemically bonded together. For example, air is a mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide and more. Solutions are mixtures too, like salt water. It's a mixture of water and sodium chloride. The sodium chloride is dissolved in the water. You can't see it. You can separate large insoluble particles from a liquid using filtration, like sand from water, as sand can't dissolve in water. Crystallization can leave a solute, that's the solid dissolved in a liquid, behind as you evaporate the solvent from a solution, like evaporating water from salt solution, leaving only salt crystals behind. Similarly, distillation involves heating the solution as well, but this time the gas is cooled, so it condenses back into a liquid. You can also do this at different temperatures to separate the different liquids of a mixture, as they'll have different boiling points. This is called fractional distillation. These are all physical processes though, and not chemical reactions, because no new substances are being made. Solid, liquid and gas are the three main states of matter. For example, water can be ice, a solid, where the particles or molecules in this case vibrate about fixed positions. It can also be liquid water, when the molecules are still touching but are free to move past each other. And it can be gas, water vapour we call it when it's water, where the particles are far apart and move randomly and they also have the most energy and so move quickly. As molecules in a gas are far apart, gases can be compressed while solids and liquids cannot. To melt or evaporate a substance, you must supply energy, usually in the form of heat, to overcome the electrostatic forces of attraction between the particles. We don't say we're breaking bonds in this case, though. Note that none of these make a new substance, so these have to be physical changes. We indicate what state substances are in with state symbols. Brackets S for solid, L for liquid, G for gas, and AQ for aqueous. That means dissolved or in solution, again like salt in water. The idea of what atoms are like came about gradually. J.J. Thompson discovered that atoms are made up of positive and negative charges. He came up with the plum pudding model of the atom, a positive charge with lots of little negative charges dotted around it, electrons. It was then Ernest Rutherford who found that the positive charge must actually be incredibly small. We now call this the nucleus. He discovered this by finding that most alpha particles fired at a thin leaf of gold atoms went straight through, proving that atoms must be mostly empty space. Niels Bohr later discovered that electrons exist in shells or orbitals. Then James Chadwick discovered that the nucleus must also contain some neutral charges. We call these neutrons, while the positive charges in the nucleus are called protons. Protons and electrons have equal and opposite charges, so we just say they're plus one and minus one, relatively. Neutrons have a charge of zero. Protons and neutrons have essentially the same mass, so we say they have a relative mass of one. Electrons are very light in comparison, so we say they have a mass of zero or just very small, depending on the situation. The periodic table tells us everything we need to know about an atom. The bottom number is the atomic number, that's the number of protons in the nucleus. That determines what element an atom is. Every atom has an overall neutral charge, so that must mean that they have the same number of electrons as protons. If an atom gains or loses electrons, it's now called an ion, not an atom. The top number is the mass number, or relative atomic mass, or RAM for short. It tells you how many protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, so that must mean that this carbon atom, carbon-12, has six neutrons on top of its six protons to make that 12. However, you can get a carbon atom with seven neutrons instead, so its relative mass is 13. 
These are what we call isotopes, atoms of the same element but with different numbers of neutrons. You might see a mass number that isn't a whole number. This is because periodic tables sometimes show the average mass for all of the isotopes of that element found in the world. For example, if you have some chlorine gas, it turns out that 75% of the atoms will have a mass of 35, while 25% of the atoms will be 37. This is what we call their relative abundance. To find the average, we just pretend that we have 100 atoms. We add up the total masses of all the isotopes, then just divide by 100. That's why chlorine's average relative atomic mass is 35.5. The periodic table is incredibly useful, but how was it made? Before it, scientists just put elements in order of their atomic weight. Some were then grouped together if they were seen to have similar properties, but still using the atomic weight order. Dmitry Mendeleev then came along and grouped elements together based on their properties, even if the order didn't follow atomic weight. Using this method, he found there were gaps in the table. He asserted that these elements were yet to be discovered, and in time, he was proven right, showing that his table was indeed correct. Electrons exist in shells around the nucleus. The shells fill up from the inside, with a maximum of two electrons on the first shell, eight on the second, and eight on the third shell, then we only go to two on the fourth shell. That's 20 electrons altogether, which brings us to a calcium atom. After this, we get into the transition metals, where things get a little bit crazy, so we leave that for A-level chemistry. So we only care about the electron configurations going up to 2882. Magnesium has 12 electrons, so its electron configuration must be 282. The periodic table can be split up into different bits. For example, everything to the left of this staircase is called a metal. Metal atoms always donate electrons when they bond to gain an empty outer shell of electrons. Again, transition metals are weird, but we don't think about their shells for now. To the right of the staircase, non-metals. They always accept electrons to gain a full outer shell. The column an atom is in is called its group. It tells you how many electrons an atom has in its outer shell. Again, the transition metals work in a really weird way, so they don't get their own groups. In fact, it turns out this is because they can donate a different number of electrons depending on what they're bonding to. The atoms in group 1 are called the alkali metals. They all have one electron in their outer shell, which they give away or donate when they bond to something. So they all have similar properties, like when they react with water. The further down the group you go, though, the further that outer electron is from the nucleus. So the electrostatic attraction is weaker between the negative electron and the positive nucleus. This means that the electron is more easily donated. This means the metals get more reactive as you go down the group. Group 7 are what we call the halogens. They're essentially the opposite. They have seven electrons in their outer shell, so they need one more electron to gain a full outer shell. The further down the group you go, the less readily an electron is accepted onto that shell that's further away from the nucleus, so they get less reactive down the group. Their boiling points also increase down the group. Group 0, sometimes referred to as group 8, are called the noble gases. They already have an empty or full outer shell, depending on your perspective, so they don't react. Well, in reality, sometimes they can react under special conditions, so we just say they're very unreactive. We don't really say group 8 anymore though because some people thought that helium might feel a little left out as it only has two electrons in its outer shell. As electrons are negative themselves, metals become positively charged when they lose them. Metals always form positive ions. All of group 1 lose one electron when they turn into an ion, so all of their ions are 1 plus. But again, we don't write the 1, we just put plus. Group 2 lose two electrons to get an empty outer shell, so their ions are all 2 plus. Group 7 gain one electron each, so all of their ions are minus 1, just minus. Group 6 ions are all 2 minus. The atoms in group 3, 4 and 5 don't really form ions, except for aluminium which is 3 plus. Like we said, transition metals can donate different numbers of electrons, for example an iron ion can be Fe2 plus, or Fe3+. It can donate two or three electrons, depending on the situation. So we give the ions the name iron 2, the two in brackets, and iron 3 to distinguish between them. Transition metals are generally harder and less reactive than other metals. They also form coloured compounds. Bonding next. Metal atoms bond to each other through metallic bonding. Essentially, a lattice or grid of ions is formed with a sea of delocalised electrons around them. Delocalized just means they're not exactly on the atom anymore. As these electrons are free to move, metals make good conductors of electricity and heat.
Metals bond to non-metals through ionic bonding. Like we said, a group 1 metal needs to lose an electron, while a group 7 atom needs to gain one. It's a match made in heaven. For example, a lithium atom donates or loans its outer electron to the chlorine atom. We can draw a dot and cross diagram to show where the electrons end up. We only need to draw the outer shell for each of these. Don't forget to put brackets and the charge of the ions too. When it comes to ionic bonding, the charges of all ions in an ionic compound must add up to zero. So Li plus and Cl minus is all good. So this is the chemical formula for lithium chloride. The same with beryllium oxide, Be2 plus and O2 minus. So it's just BeO. Beryllium chloride, on the other hand, well, the beryllium needs to lose two electrons while a chlorine atom only needs one. So that means there must be two chlorines or chloride ions for every beryllium. So Be2 plus and two lots of Cl minus add up to zero. So that means the chemical formula is BeCl2, sorted. Ionic compounds consist of lots of repeating units of these ions in a lattice to form a crystal. They have high melting points and boiling points due to the strong electrostatic forces that need to be overcome. They can conduct electricity, but only when they're in liquid form, that is molten or dissolved in solution. That's because the ions are free to move in both cases and they carry charge. You can also get molecular ions. For example, OH- is a hydroxide ion. It consists of a hydrogen atom and an oxygen atom. Here are a few other examples. By the way, I still spell sulfate with a PH instead of an F because I'm stubborn and refuse to adopt the American spelling. You'll get the mark either way. Any ionic compound can be called a salt, not only sodium chloride, table salt. The name is always the metal ion, positive ion, or cation, we can call it, followed by the non-metal ion, or anion. Anion names are different from their normal names, like we've just seen, so it's not sodium chlorine, but sodium chloride. Some people find it helpful to remember which way round cations and anions are by liking cats, which can be nice creatures sometimes. They say cations are positive or positive. Non-metals bond to each other with covalent bonding to form molecules. They do this by sharing electrons to gain full outer shells. For example, chlorine gas is Cl2. Each chlorine atom shares an electron with the other, so they both have full outer shells. So they're both happy. Never write that in the exam though. Here's the dot and cross diagram. We can also draw the structural formula for molecules with just symbols and lines representing the covalent bonds. We say that every one of these covalent bonds represents a dot cross electron pair. Each oxygen atom needs two extra electrons, so O2 is a result of each oxygen atom sharing two electrons each. As such, this is a double covalent bond, two dot cross pairs. A good thing to remember is that the number of electrons an atom needs is the same as the number of covalent bonds it must make. Hydrogen can only ever make one bond. Carbon makes four bonds, etc. Here are a few more examples. If you're not in a rush, pause the video and have a go at figuring out the dot and cross diagrams and structural formula for all of these. And here are the answers. These above are what we call simple molecular or simple covalent structures, individual molecules that can all mix together. These have relatively low boiling points as there are only weak intermolecular forces between them that need to be overcome with heating. Be careful though, they're not covalent bonds being broken in this case. And unlike ionic compounds, these can't conduct electricity, even as liquids. Giant covalent bonding is similar to the lattice nature of ionic compounds. Atoms form covalent bonds to other atoms, which form bonds to other atoms, and so on, until what we have in effect is one giant molecule. Diamond is an example of this. It's a crystal of carbon atoms bonded to each other. That's why it's so hard and has such a high melting point. You'd have to break the covalent bonds in order to change it, and they're incredibly strong. Graphite consists of layers of carbons with three covalent bonds each in a hexagonal structure. Where's the carbon's fourth bond, you might ask? Well, the spare delocalized electrons form special weak bonds between the layers, which means that this can actually conduct electricity because the electrons can move between the layers. And it also means the layers can slide over each other easily too, which is why it's used for pencils. As a side note, it's the opposite with metal alloys. They're stronger than pure metals because having mixtures of different metals means we have different size atoms and that disrupts the regular lattice so layers can't slide over each other as easily. Back to carbon allotropes. Graphene is just a single layer of graphite. 
Fullerenes are 3D structures of carbon atoms. For example, Buckminster fullerene is a spherical football-like structure consisting of 60 carbon atoms. Fullerenes that have a tube shape are called nanotubes. Surface to volume ratio is just one divided by the other. If the length of a side of a cube doubles, this ratio halves. As nanoparticles are tiny, this ratio is huge for them, which means that fewer of them could be needed to fulfill a purpose compared to larger ones. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like and a comment if you did. And click on the card to take you to the playlist for all of the papers. And don't forget to check out the Science Shorts app to help you test your knowledge.